Hello and welcome to another episode of Conflict on Camera and today we are entering the Pacific Theatre for a photo taken on the island of Peleliu and joining me today is a friend of mine from a few years who visited Normandy with me, uh, Ryan Lowry. So welcome to the show, Ryan. Well, thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate it. So tell us about, before we get into the photo, just briefly what it is you're doing right now with your touring kind of museum. So I run a company called Patriot Preservation LLC, and it specializes in traveling exhibits dedicated to World War II. There are roughly about 10,000 artifacts in the collection, and they're broken down into a variety of themes ranging from America's story in World War II all the way to the Battle for the Aleutian Islands on Attu and Kiska. During that time, I also give speeches at universities, museums, and uh, a lot of different grades K through 12 on the story of World War II. So there's a there's a lot of World War II involvement with this company for sure. Well, brilliant. And as usual, folks, links to Ryan's projects are in the description below on YouTube. So I have to say, Ryan, the photo you submitted wasn't one I was familiar with, but it did intrigue me and I have had requests to do more Pacific content. So before we get into the history of the photo, of all the many, many photos that you could have offered me for this perhaps first appearance on the show, what is it that drew you to this particular photo? So when you look at it for the first time, and this was my impression when I first saw it, is the just strain of combat that Marines and soldiers were subjected to in the Pacific Theater. Of course, the Pacific Theater as a whole is such a unique anomaly in the nature of the fighting. Uh, the Japanese were not willing to surrender on these islands uh, as the United States hopped all the way to Japan. And you know, the strain of combat itself was just so much for these men, especially at this place, uh, at Peleliu. It's really just a overall symbol of what the Marines are going to encounter there, as well as the uh, U.S. Army soldiers that take their place. Yeah, absolutely. And the first thing... I always think of when I think of the, the Pacific is the complete terrain difference to me, an ETO guy, you know, out there, it's not just hills, it's mountains, it's escarpments, it's rocky shorelines, it's lack of drinking water, it's disease, mosquitoes, all the other elements to go into the Pacific uh, campaign that perhaps aren't a feature in the same way as the ETO. So tell us about the photo, your research you've done for the purposes of this show. Yes, yeah, so there's actually quite an interesting story behind this one. Uh, you know, you talk about photography in the Pacific Theater, and a lot of the time we only get a small, vague excerpt of what we're looking at. But this one, fortunately, the historical record has been saved. So the gentleman that we're looking at in the photograph, his name is Frank Pomroy, and he is about six days into the Battle of Peleliu, which had began on September 15th, 1944. And he was no green marine, as you would call it. He's not fresh to the Pacific. He had been at Guadalcanal in the first waves on August 7, 1942, and he had survived the Battle of Alligator Creek later that month. He'd also fought at Cape Gloucester, and Peleliu was his third campaign by this time. But later on in his life, Frank would actually say that this was the toughest fight he had in the whole war. And this picture is actually of his last day fighting in the Pacific. He would not go with the 1st Marine Division to Okinawa. He actually served in H Company 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, the 1st Marine Division, the famed division that is featured in the HBO series, The Pacific. So just kind of backtracking where this story begins is a couple of days earlier during the landings. He is with two different men, one of his best buddies that he had been with since the Battle of Guadalcanal, and a fresh new replacement. And just during the landings alone, uh, his buddy is shot through the hand with a bullet, and he is evacuated from the island, and this replacement is killed getting off the landing craft. So that is his first day during the Battle of Peleliu, which originally was scheduled to only be a three-day operation. As the commander of the 1st Marine Division commented, we're going to be in this. It's going to be rough, but fast, like Tarawa. We're going to be in and out in three days. And from the first few hours during the Battle of Peleliu, that's going to be very apparent this was not going to be the case at all. So flash forward a couple of days, and Frank is dug in just beyond the airfield, which is the objective for the Peleliu campaign. 
And he's dug in just on the outer edge of the airfield near a limestone and coral ridge line. And his unit is about to enter what are known as the Umerbrogel Mountains, which run along the neck of Peleliu and is going to be the focal point for the rest of the battle. And on this particular day, a Japanese soldier actually runs over the crest of this limestone and coral rise and charges at Frank with a Japanese rifle with a bayonet on the end of it. And Frank actually shoots this soldier in the stomach. He lurches back and the soldier keeps on coming at him. And Frank finally fires the fatal round that kills this Japanese soldier, but the bayonet lands and hits Frank in the left leg. And you can actually see where he's hit by this bayonet in the photograph in the lower left-hand corner. His garments are actually torn and there's actually blood splatters on his uniform, on his pants, and also on his camouflage cover uh, in the photograph. And so he suffers his first wounds during the Battle of Peleliu. And he goes through this Japanese soldier's pack. He says he's a very young kid, probably 16 or 17 years old. And he finds photographs of his family. And he's taken very much by this. This is really the first time that it dawns on him that he has been fighting human beings. During the Pacific War, this was not really something that the Allies entertained because of the ferocity of the Japanese in the Pacific. So he takes the photographs and puts them back in the wallet rather than take them as souvenirs and uh, goes through and finds the Japanese soldier's lunch and holds on to it because he had not eaten very much during the past three days or so. And that's his first wound. So you can clearly see it in the photograph. And there comes a point where H Company begins to move out and head into the Umerbogel Mountains. The fighting begins to really intensify for the Battle of Peleliu right at this point. You have major strong points that are critical for the Japanese defense. Hill 100, Hill 200, Hill 210, these are major areas of what is known as Bloody Nose Ridge, the very southern end of the Umerbogels that had laid devastating artillery fire on the landing beaches on D-Day and also during the crossing of the airfield. So as Frank is getting ready to go in to the hills, he is rallied up by a Lieutenant Fournier and eight other men. These men are young. A lot of them are probably replacements and they're gung-ho and they're ready to get into some action. So Lieutenant Fournier takes these men and starts moving towards Hill 200. And as he's moving towards Hill 200, they actually come under fire by a Japanese field piece way up in the mountains and the Marine casualties begin to mount. And a couple are picked off instantly by a Japanese sniper who's specifically taking headshots at the Marines. And eventually, Lieutenant Fournier and Frank actually die for cover and they just wait it out. They wait this whole thing out. One of the men is actually hit in the head and begins to read from his Bible and Lieutenant Fournier screams over. He says, there is no time for this. We don't have time for this. And the Marine dies. And Lieutenant Fournier and Frank start talking about what to do. They try to decide, should they stay? Should they leave? And it's right around this time that a Colonel Hamelswich of the 2nd Battalion jumps in a foxhole with them. And Frank, seeing this Colonel come up to him, scoots out of the way. And the Colonel says to both Lieutenant Fournier and Frank, we need to hold this position. This is the farthest penetration we have into this sector. You must hold it at all cost. And the Colonel somehow escapes. Frank is unsure years later of how the Colonel escapes this fusillade of fire that's coming down on them. And the Lieutenant decides that there is a need for reinforcements. They need more Marines up here to be able to hold this position as the Colonel is ordered. So Eventually, Frank says, I'll stay. You go and get reinforcements. And the lieutenant says, no, I'm the commanding officer in charge. You go get reinforcements. I'll hold the line. So rather than disobeying the lieutenant, Frank jumps over the side of this ravine and into a swampy area under machine gun fire. And he can actually see spurts of water actually hit all around him as he 
swims through the swamp and he goes down to the marine lines and he finds a bunch of marines around a tank and he tells this tank commander he said i have a lieutenant up in the hills who needs my help and we need to reinforce him immediately so the tanks begin to move out with this small group of marines and they head up to the last known position around hill 200 and a japanese field piece opens up the tank just immediately in front of it. The tank commander opens his hatch and says, I'm not going any further. This is as far as I'm going to take this. If I go any further towards this hill, the Japanese artillery is going to knock me out. And so Frank does not get the tanks that he wants. And the Marines eventually pull back because of the heavy fire. Frank makes his way back to where he had been before, but loaded with ammunition. And Lieutenant Fournier is not there. So he holds his position as ordered for the next several days. And during that time, he's deprived of food and water, but has plenty of ammunition. So as he waits in the hills, he looks over the crest during the next three days and there's a Japanese officer walking with maybe perhaps one of his subordinates. And Frank decides he's going to pick them both off. He gets his subordinate first, and the Japanese officer actually charges at him with a samurai saber, and he takes them both down, and he realizes he needs to leave this position immediately. At this point, he is wounded for his second time by machine gun fire that went through his sciatic nerve, so he's already losing blood fast from that and the Japanese bayonet wound from a few days ago, and He's laying on the ground and he thinks this is probably going to be his last moment on earth. He's just losing strength completely. He can barely even crawl at this point. And finally, a Marine Amtrak comes up to his rescue with other Marines. And this is six days into the Battle of Peleliu. He's been going nonstop. And the only thing Frank can do is barely muster enough strength to take his white undershirt and begin waving it sporadically. And the Marines that approach Frank automatically think he's a Japanese trying to surrender until they finally realize that he is actually a U.S. Marine. And Frank tells these Marines, he says, look, uh, I have plenty of ammunition. I need water and food. And the Marines tell him, you don't need water and food. You need a hospital ship. You need to get off the line right away. And it's at this moment that news correspondent Stanley Troutman uh, who had already served on Saipan earlier that summer in 1944, approaches Frank and he snaps this picture. And Frank is completely unaware that this photo is even being taken until Stanley goes up to him, taps him on the shoulder and says, that is the best picture I've taken of the war. And he has it processed later on. Frank eventually survives his wounds and goes to the Admiralties for hospital treatment of his bayonet and machine gun wounds and is out of the war. The Battle of Peleliu continues on from September all the way into November before the Japanese garrison collapses. Stanley has a lot of opportunities to take photographs. After this, he's in the assault on Corregidor. He has a chance to be at the USS Missouri Surrender on September 2nd, but declines it to take photos at the aftermath of the bombing of Nagasaki. And to his dying day, this was probably his favorite photograph. So it's quite a story we're looking at here. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and this one certainly is. And fortunately, Frank Pomeroy lived until 2011 to convey this story to us. Well, I'm totally disappointed by the lack of detail you've given to that, Ryan. He said sarcastically. <laughs> no, I mean, awesome stuff. I mean, you had me spellbound during all that. And I mean, it is it is an amazing image. And I think when you started at the beginning about we do have this perception of the, the poor guys fighting for the Pacific going through in almost like a trance because it was so awful out there. They just had to kind of switch off their emotions. And th this yeah, is one of those rare photos that really does convey someone breaking down effectively in the middle of or at the end of profound combat the the horror of these campaigns is something that we particularly people like myself who study the eto we need to be reminded of the brutality of the pacific campaign and this photo absolutely ably demonstrates in a single shot that those guys went through something absolutely horrific and and hats off to them for enduring it absolutely <laughs> 
Well, that was brilliant, right? There's nothing else to say. That was a, a perfect episode of Conflict on Camera. And exactly what we want to do is just take some time to look at these photos. I think this is a typical kind of coffee book table photo in the sense that when you're flicking through a book, you spend a few seconds looking at it. And because you're now, thank you viewers, watching this show, you're almost being forced to look at that photo for 10 minutes, 12 minutes. And I think that's good because it helps sear it into your mind. It's what you're looking at the different details. You're looking at the, the camouflage on the helmet. You're looking at the uh, the waste ground around it, the site of destruction around him. There's nothing living anywhere near in that, you know, and, and it, it, everything is conveyed by that single image. So, well, again, I can only say thank you very much for doing this. And for those watching, if you are someone like Ryan, you don't have to be a professional historian. You don't have to be a published author. But if there's a photo that you know about or you'd like to research and you'd like to come on here and talk about, we would be very welcome to have you on board. And in this case, Ryan's research clearly is beyond average there. He knew everything about it. I could see he wasn't even reading any notes there all coming out of his head. So fantastic stuff. So again, thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll see you all again. This is Conflict on Camera for World War II TV.